Hi, my name is Alexey Borisenko. In today's episode, we are going to talk about how to create customized enterprise Gen AI assistance and apps powered by retrieval augmented generation and NLP guardrails. Today, we are thrilled to have Ola, product management lead at Outshift by Cisco. Hi, Ola. Could you tell us a bit about yourself and your responsibilities as a product manager? Hi, Alexi. Thank you for having me today. Um, uh, as you rightly said, um, I'm a product management lead here uh, at Outshift uh, by Cisco. And then Outshift is uh, Cisco's incubation engine, and we are uh, forward-looking. Uh, we look at what's coming up next uh, in, the, in the marketplace in terms of technology innovations. And we try to build products that are meaningful for our, co for our customers as well as the company uh, based on that. And one of those products here is uh, what we're going to talk about today, uh, Generative AI. Uh, in my role, we, we spend a lot of time with customers uh, to ensure that we understand uh, the pain points. Uh, we co co capture that and we summarize that in a way that is quick for our engineering teams to go ahead and start building um, POCs that we test out with customers. And then eventually, uh, the customer feedback helps us to actually refine the product uh, and have a, an MVP that is launchable uh, and usable by customers. And then that gets refined over time. Uh, again, using customer feedback and market signals. Uh, in addition to that, my role involves uh, uh, making sure that all the internal teams are aligned, uh, working with teams around uh, uh, the, the, the engineering teams primarily, and then uh, uh, go to market teams, uh, marketing, sales, finance teams, uh, just ensuring that as we are building the right product for customers, we are also making sure that we can build uh, something that is sustainable uh, in terms of the business uh, for our company. And with that, uh, I would like to maybe uh, talk a little bit more about the product, uh, hand it back to you, Alexi, to see where we want to start. Uh, yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about Notific, how um, this um, software as a service can help uh, to create Gen AI assistance or um, Gen AI application? So uh, Motific was built uh, or was started based on uh, what we saw in the marketplace. Uh, we had customers who um, had a lot of employees who wanted to use uh, chat assistants uh, or, or chatbots that were based on public elements. And uh, there were concerns about privacy, uh, leakage of sensitive data, uh, sharing of privacy information about customers, about the business, or loss of IP intellectual property. And uh, these concerns made some of our customers go ahead and start to shut down the use of this uh, public lang language models or foundation models. And then customers came to us and said, we, we need something that is trusted. Uh, we need a solution that we can trust. Uh, we need a, a, an environment where we can en enable our employees to stay productive uh, using language models to do their daily jobs. And the idea of Motific uh, was born out of that. So we looked at scenarios where um, Customers wanted to bring their data uh, to interact with language models, third-party language models, calling their APIs. Uh, we needed a solution for that. And then addressing the problem about trust and safety, we needed a solution for that. And so we had this idea of combining a set of guardrails that allows customers to control or, or maintain trust in the system, and then a set of uh, features that allows customers to bring their data into that workflow. So you have this comprehensive solution that captures uh, the ability to bring your own data, uh, your own files from different data sources, uh, be it SharePoint or uh, some other internal websites, uh, where we can ingest that through the RAC pipeline, enable you to take that data and feed it into a prompt interface uh, as part of context that you need to make a query to a language model. So employees can stay productive using internal data uh, the, the teams that are responsible for safety of the company feel uh, comfortable because now this is under uh, a set of guard drills that they control. And then you, you have a, a variety of models that you can interact with uh, across, the, across the company. So somebody in marketing might like to use a model from uh, Azure OpenAI. Some other person in sales might like to use a model from Mistral. Somebody else from supply chain might like to use a model from Gemini. You have this flexibility in the system that allows, allows you to choose your own model but you have your own data in the workflow, and then you have this guide rules that allows you to control or maintain trust and safety across the system. So that's what we built with Motific at a high level, 
And again, it addresses the, the pain points across knowledge workers in the company and developers who are trying to build applications uh, that interact with language models. And then you have personas like the CISOs, the CDOs, legal teams who are concerned about trust and safety. And then last but not the least, you have the, the GMs who are concerned about return on investment. Am I getting any benefits out of these interactions with LLMs? We also provide some level of insights and business analytics that allows them to see the benefits they're getting out of interactions with generative AI models. Yeah, I have some things. Um, okay, can you show uh, how does this work under the hood? So uh, which interface users uh, should utilize, which uh, personas do you have in platform? Yeah, sure. Um, so let, let's quickly run through this uh, simple slides that just shows the high level solution. And then from there, we will um, jump into the solution. It's into the into this into the, the demo itself. So um, I think I'm sharing my slides now you can see the introduction yeah. to Motific. Yeah. Yeah. So at a high level, this is what uh, we're delivering. Again, it, it's it's a it's a solution that um, enables us to deliver rapid and trusted usage of generative AI applications in an enterprise, and we're addre addressing a variety of problem statements for different stakeholders in an enterprise. Uh, we have the business end users who just want to communicate or interact with the language model uh, using natural language, and they don't really care about all of the complexities that are behind the scenes. They just want to take a file from their marketing repository and be able to query the LLM using that file. Uh, we have the developers who are calling an API on the, on the language model side, and they want to be able to do that also efficiently to address business needs. And then we have the folks who are responsible for the safety and trust of the company. And they want to ensure that uh, every time the business users on the business functions are querying the language models, that everything is done in a safe and trusted manner. So that means that you have a level of trust uh, and security uh, with guardrails that enables you to, to have uh, toxicity filters, hallucination controls, uh, making sure that there is no leakage of sensitive data and so on. And then last but not the least, you have the business gym who is responsible for allocating budgets and their, their interest is in understanding what people are doing with the tool uh, and also understanding some level of insight that is business related for them to make justifications for budgets to invest in these language models. So we are addressing the, 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 the problem statements or needs of all of these stakeholders, but we also put the control in the central team's hands. So you can have a central administrator who sits in the, either within the business function or within the central IT team. And their job is to do the management and configuration of all of this need of all of these different knobs for these stakeholders on the left hand side. The system also comes with interact or integration with third party uh, entities. For example, if you have an Active Directory service and you want to be able to track your users at a user level, uh, you, we 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 upload your user information into the system so you can track what each individual is doing for audit trail purposes. Uh, also, integration with uh, organizational specific data sets. So we're talking about your RAD pipeline. So the ability for you to have a RAD pipeline that is powered by uh, that RAD powered assistance and API. So that means that we have a, instead of connectors, uh, we have uh, embedding models. We do the processing of the data and the chunking of the data, and then the indexing of your of your files in, in an index in the, in the knowledge base so that you can query that knowledge base as part of your workflow uh, when you are making the call to the LLM. And so that is part of the solution. Again, all of that complexity is hidden from the user. Uh, all you need to do is to know where your files are and be able to attach those files into the RAD pipeline and then make, make a call through those files to the LLM. And um, uh, the last thing, again, I think I talked about this earlier on is that uh, this system allows you to, to use any language models that you choose. So you don't have to be stuck with one, uh, whether it's an internal model that you fine tune for yourself or it's a third party model that you can call through an API uh, we have the flexibility to enable you to do that across all of the use cases that you have on the left-hand side. So at a high level, this is what the solution allows us to do. Now, in terms of the, the flow of information across the system, when somebody, for example, in marketing is making a call to a third-party model over here, the call usually goes through the system. Again, it fetches the right context from our RAG knowledge base, which is built across the pipeline that I, that I described earlier on. 
And then that context is used uh, in addition to a system prompt to go through the policy guardrails. The policy guardrails are configured by the administrator to do exactly what the company wants them to do for every query. And once those guardrails make a decision, that query goes ahead and goes to the LLM where the LLM makes its, uh, does its reasoning or does its own tasks. And then the response comes back through the system again. We check for things like toxic content, make sure that the, there's no hallucination of the response. And then on its way back, uh, we send that back to the end user. So this is a high level view of what happens when the end user sends a query through Motific on the way to the generative AI model and then on the way back to the user. So with that, I'm going to now um, go into the system itself. Uh, I'm going to show you what the, what the product looks like and then how uh, uh, an administrator can build out a set of assistants or API endpoints and allow this users on the left-hand side to make their calls to the model yeah. and be able to actually have those calls pass through these different components of the system. So um, now this is what the system looks like uh, at the high level. So we have a uh, this is a console that the end that the administrator is going to use. Again, the administrator can be someone that sits in the business function, or uh, you, you can call them citizen developers, or somebody that sits in central IT uh, who works either in this in the chief data office of chief data office or the uh, chief security office. And their role here is really to help employees to build out assistance and APIs that talk to their data and also has guardrails that are managing the conversation between the end user and the language models. Now, to get to that point of actually creating uh, an assistant endpoint or an API endpoint for the business function teams, we have to go through four steps. The first step is to actually connect to a model provider of your choice. The second step is to actually build out your knowledge base, which is based on the RAG uh, pipeline that I described earlier on. And then the third step will be to actually uh, configure your own guardrails. So this guardrails is what is going to come to is going to control the conversation, uh, make sure that the conversations are, are adhering to the company policies. And then last but not the least, we generate the assistance and APIs out of this uh, first three steps. Um, we also have this capability that we call intelligence. So intelligence allows us to understand exactly what people are doing in the system. So are they doing Q and A's mostly, or are they creating new content, maybe asking for summarization of content? Are they requesting coding support? Uh, are they trying to do a brainstorming session with the LLM? All of this is available uh, as part of insights that are captured by intelligence model. Our intelligence model allows us to understand this. And in addition to that, the intelligence model also gives you information about uh, uh, time savings. So how am, I, how am I improving in productivity of my employees? Uh, so for example, in this case, we see the spider chat that shows us that content creation seems to be the one that is generating the most value for the company uh, because a lot of people will spend a lot of time. Traditionally, if I wanted to create new content, right, I will have to go and read, read up and do a lot of research and then summarize my research and then rewrite my own summary out of that research. All of that is gonna take me a lot of time. Now I give that information to a language model to do the same for me. Uh, the language model is able to process all of this context quickly, summarize the output for me. And then the time I have to actually do the summarization and the, and the, and the, and the validation of the summary is much reduced than what I would have done if I was doing it myself. So this is what we're seeing in this chart here where it says we are saving 50%, almost 50% of the time when we use the LLMs to do content creation uh, in this particular company. So this is an example of how we're showing the insights of how value is being captured uh, for the company using this LLM assistance uh, for, 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 for content creation tasks. And so with that, um, I would like to go through how we actually build out this assistance for, our cost for, for an employee in the company. So I'm gonna put on the hat of an IT administrator or an ad administrator in a business function and I have a request coming in from marketing. Marketing has said, hey, I need, uh, I have this set of files in SharePoint, or I have a set of uh, websites that I want to be able to ingest data from and be able to use that data uh, when I'm making queries to the language model. Uh, the language model of my choice is, I can pick any one out of the list that, we, that I have here. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and connect to a model. That's the first step. So um, I give it a name, I call it uh, marketing, marketing uh, connection. And then um, the system comes out of the box. Today we support uh, 
language models from different providers, uh, from Azure OpenAI, from Mistral, and from AWS Bedrock, as well as Gemini. So I'm going to pick the one that I choose, that the marketing team, marketing team have asked for a model that connects to Mistral, for example. So I'm going to pick that as my, as my model provider. And then I'm going to input my API keys. So my API keys for, for the, this particular case, um, I'm not able to share it right now because it's, this is a public uh, uh, broadcast. So uh, I'm going to assume that uh, I'm plugging in an API key here. And then I pick the model that I want to have interactions with uh, from this provider. Uh, in this case, I pick all of these models as my models of choice because I want to be able to use this for various use cases. So once I pick the models, I come over here, I test my connection, and I add my connection. And when I go through this step, what happens is I'm going to see my model show up on this list here. So I'm going to see uh, the latest model. This is one I created about a few days back. Uh, uh, this is a model that was built uh, for different use case. Uh, I went through the same steps. I selected the same set of models, and I'm able to use this model for this particular request that is coming from marketing. So that's step number one, connection to a model. Again, there's a variety of models out there. Um, enterprises want to be able to use the one that best suits the use case. So we provide this flexibility across the board that you can choose the provider and then choose a specific model that you desire for your specific use case. Step number yeah. one. Uh, yeah, I really enjoy this idea to switching between the models and uh, thanks for showing these uh, features. Uh, am I understanding right that, uh, for example, for some marketing needs, uh, users can uh, choose and create motif with uh, Mistral, for example, then with some other provider and then can compare results uh, of uh, these two models based on uh, their uh, use cases. That is an interesting question. Um, so we do have the capability to actually allow you to compare how your various models are, can perform relative to the tasks that is being performed in marketing, for example. So uh, before we go through steps two and three and four, I want to show how that actually works. So if I go to my intelligence tab, that's one of the capabilities we provide today. So I'm going to pick one of the um, motives. So a motive is just an assistant endpoint or, or, or an API. And then I'm going to pick one of them that we have, um, uh, let's just say, over the last one month, because we've been using this over the last one month. And I'm going to um, look for one of them where I can uh, most time save. Let's use that, for example. So let's go here. This is a, this is a marketing one. Now, um, your question was talking about optimization. So how can I optimize this assistant or API endpoint uh, for the task that is being performed by the marketing team using it? We can compare that optimization from a from model perspective. So in this case, currently, the team here is using an Azure OpenAI model for their tasks. And we can see an overview of the tasks that they are performing here. And they are mostly doing content creation. And just one question was asked in this particular case. Now, if I, if I was using a different model for this particular task of content creation, will I be op optimizing on cost, quality, or delay? How we do that is by going to select another model, for example. Let's pick one from Mistral, for example, and say, if this is a what-if analysis, what if I was using Azure or Open Mistral's 7B? Will I be optimizing on cost, quality, and delay? And for what we're seeing here, this is telling us that if I switched from the Azure GPT-4 Turbo to Mistral 7B, I will be saving a ton on cost. My quality mm -hmm. will also may, maybe not as good um, because GPT-4 Turbo provides more quality based on this analysis. And I also have lower delay. So depending on what you want to optimize for, if you want to optimize for cost or quality or delay, you can do this what-if analysis across models uh, with, this, with, this, with this particular feature. And it tells you what is the best thing for you regarding the specific tasks that have been performed by specific team within your organization. In this case, the marketing team is doing content creation. And, and it seems like switching to Mistral might be the best option for them from a cost and delay perspective. So that's an example of uh, an answer to your question in terms of the flexibility we have between choosing a variety of models. And what needs to be done here is really is simple. You can always, if you want to make a, this decision to change, you can go to 
uh, this particular motif. Um, you do an edit. Uh, so let's just pick one of this marketing events. You edit this and then pick the right model that you want. So you can pick the edits uh, here and just switch around your models and go to a different model that makes best sense for your, for your use case. So it's, it's as simple as that. So uh, would you like me to go on with uh, the next step uh, after we connect the model connections? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, so um... yeah. So the next step is really to the, the RAG pipeline that I talked about. Um, this is a process where we actually build out the knowledge base that provides context to every query that is coming in from the marketing team in this particular case. So again, the first thing you do is to give it a name. Uh, we can give it a uh, give it just any name, marketing knowledge base, KB. And then we have the options of adding data sources. Uh, right now, we show data sources across SharePoint. So everything in SharePoint today, uh, including PDF files, uh, text files, JSON files, uh, XLS files, whatever it is, right? Uh, you can ingest all those file types. Uh, we have connectors to SharePoint that can ingest that data. And then uh, pretty soon, you're going to see a lot more uh, rectangles here with different data sources. You can also ingest websites uh, with a URL uh, simply. Uh, for the sake of the time we have today, we're going to just make this a website ingestion process. So uh, in this particular case, we can ingest um, data from any website, uh, public website for now. Uh, let's just say we want to ingest data from our uh, Motific website. So Motific, so I'm going to uh, call the Motific.ai website. Motific.ai. So I want to ingest all the information from that website and use it, use it as a knowledge base for all of my queries. Uh, so let's go ahead and then um, schedule that. Um, so you can schedule this to happen one time, or you can actually make it happen on a frequent basis. So you want to resync. Uh, with the latest information from that website, you can choose to do that resync daily, weekly, or monthly. And then when this process starts, uh, for the sake of time, again, I'm just going to do a one-time ingestion. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Now, again, you can also add multiple websites to one knowledge base. For now, I'm just going to add one website to this one knowledge base and make it a one-time ingestion. Now, I'm going to do, go ahead and do add websites, create knowledge base, and then, um, okay, so there is there is a, there's an issue here because we already have a, a knowledge base that has uh, the same name. So I'm gonna have to change this to something else. That's what's showing up here. So I'm gonna call it KB2 for now. So there's uh, overwrite of the, of the original one. So I'm gonna rename it. I'm gonna go ahead with this again. Now this is what yeah. it's created you, successfully. You, you, yeah, users can add uh, any available, publicly available website. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. And what happens is uh, we have a crawler that can recursively go into a website and go 10 levels deep and be able to ingest all of the text from that website. So you can use that website as a way for you to query uh, an LLM. I'll give you an example of where that becomes uh, useful. Uh, we spoke to a, a customer in the financial sector. Uh, they have all these policies that are coming up regularly uh, from the Federal Reserve. And they said, I would like to have uh, my analysts usually go to the Federal Reserve website to look at the latest policies, interpret the policies, and be able to tell us how to uh, add, how that impacts our services to our customers. What if I'm able to go to that Federal Reserve website? I can ingest all the files and that, all the new policy documents from that Federal Reserve website. And then I can ask LLM to help me summarize the latest policies so that I can uh, quickly use that to adjust my services to my customers. That is an example of where this becomes a useful tool uh, for such customers uh, where you can ingest tons of policy documents from a public website that is useful for an analyst who is working in a bank, for example. That's one example. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, uh, it's going into a website for now, but again, like I said, it can be an internal data source uh, we have your internal SharePoint files. You have internal data sources um, that you can ingest data from and create this knowledge base that you can use for queries to the language model. Yeah, thanks. So, so now we've completed this step. Uh, again, what happened is in this particular step was we set up some connectors to this website. A crawler went into the website, crawled the information. We chunked the data, uh, and then we created embeddings from that data. And then we index that those embeddings in, a, in an index in the knowledge base so that you can use that for your queries to the LLM. So step two is completed. 
Step three is where we actually start to create the guardrails. So guardrails uh, for us today, we have a, a variety of guardrails. Uh, some of them are listed here, some of them are not here, but uh, basically we have guardrails that allows us to block prompt injection. We have guardrails that allow us to, to prevent uh, injection of harmful URLs uh, into, the, into your applications or your assistants. We have guardrails that allows us to prevent toxic content from getting exposed to employees. We have guardrails that allows us to do things around uh, data loss prevention, so specifically around PII content, uh, sensitive information about personal information. Uh, we have this, for example, if I click on this, you can see some of the examples here, uh, things like credit card numbers, email addresses, locations, phone numbers. Uh, we can uh, ask the system to block them or redact this specific information every time somebody is trying to send a prompt or context that includes any of this information. The system will go ahead and redact that information and then pass that on to the LLM for that LLM to perform its task and return the response uh, with the redacted information back to the user. Uh, so that, that's this is an example. I just wanted to pick on that one. Code presence is another one. Here we are ensuring that uh, organizations that don't want employees to share code with the third party LLM, you can detect when there's a code in the, in the prompt and then the system will either do either a blocking of the system or, or warn the user or also pass on the information to the administrator and say that we see people sending code through the system. You might want to either block it or you want to warn them about doing such things. And then the last one, which is not really the last one, is off topic. This is where we configure the system to warn the, the user or warn the administrator or actually block the system from allowing employees to chat about things that are not relevant to their job. So for example, the person in marketing uh, performing this marketing task is asking questions about gambling, for example. Um, for example, they type in a prompt that says, tell me about the best casinos to visit in Las Vegas. Now, this sentence or this prompt doesn't have any word gambling in it, but because we have this small language models on the back end that under understand context, they can understand that this prompt is asking for gambling advice. And depending on what the administrator has set this to do, it will either block that prompt from going through or ask the employee to re rewrite their prompts such a way that it doesn't violate the company policies. So this is another one that allows you to specify uh, your topics. You can specify any topic you want here, or you can use the default topics that we put into the system. So another another guardrail. A couple more guardrails that are not here. Uh, hallucination guardrail. Hallucination guardrail ensures that every time you send a prompt to uh, a model, uh, we are doing a, what we call the RAG faithfulness check. We are checking that your context was used to answer the question. And every time your context is not used to answer the question, we give you a warning that lets you know that that is the case. And then the last one is the cost control. So many organizations today are struggling with um, keeping up with the cost of calling a third party model. How do you maintain the control around that? We provide this cost control policy, uh, which is not here, but I'll show you quickly this is what it looks like. So if I go back to one of my uh, assistants here, it's called a token budget policy. This is where you tell the system to say, hey, for this particular assistant, every time somebody is sending a uh, prompt, you need to count the number of tokens that have been sent. And once they're about to hit their budget, but at 70% of the budget, for example, here I can do an edit, or they, they're about to hit 80% of their budget, you want to make sure that you give them a warning about the fact that they're about to hit their limit. And then they can start to dial down how many tokens they're generating or they're consuming uh, from their assistant. Uh, and if they actually send more than this amount right off the bat, or the API call is going to generate more than a million tokens, then the system will block that prompt from going out because it's exceeded its budget. And so that's the, that's another control that is a guardrail for maintaining costs uh, across the system. And so these are some of the guardrails we have. And so going back to the dashboard again, we've gone through steps one, two, and three. The last step here is where we create what we call a motive, which is the creation of the assistant endpoint and the API endpoint. So we do that by giving it a quick name. We give it a name. We call it um, marketing assistant assistant two, because I'm assuming we have another one called that name. Uh, we select the model that we built out. So we, we selected the connection that we've already created in step one. And then we, we pick the model we want to use for this interaction for this assistant. The next step is to go to remember uh, step two was step two was to building out the knowledge base. So we're going to pick one of the knowledge bases we built out for this particular assistant. Remember marketing KB2 was the assistant we created for this particular uh, assistant for this marketing team. 
Next thing we do is select policies. So I did not go through the process of creating those policies, but I showed you an example with the PII and the off-topic policy. Uh, we can pick the PII policy. We can pick the off-topic policy as well. Uh, just two examples here on the code detection policy, um, if I have one created. But anyway, um, code policy. So we can pick on that as well. And then once we pick on all of these policies, the next step is user access. So this is where you pick, uh, you, you, we, we do what we call um, uh, access control, so to speak. Um, in this case, we're saying that in this marketing team, we only want three individuals, for example, to have access to this assistant. So because we have integration with Active Directory, and, and we're able to provide single sign-on and also be able to ingest the user names uh, into the system. We select the users that we want to uh, add into the system uh, as individuals, or we can actually go and select the group of users from the marketing team. And then based on that, we're able to provision an assistant for this group of users. So in this case, I'm just going to pick myself as the only user for this assistant. And now we can see a summary of the assistant. We can see the name of the assistant, the model we are connected to, knowledge base we're going to be using for our queries, the policies that are going to be guard drilling, the conversations with the LLM, and then the users who have access to that assistant. When I click Add Motive, now I've created this new endpoint, set of endpoints, uh, as you can see here. It's got two policies. It's attached to this knowledge base, and we have the set of users, uh, the creator of this assistant endpoint. So if I click on this, I can see, I can set my token budget like I showed earlier on, but I'm not going to go through that right now because I've already shown us how to set the budget for the for, for token usage. We also get an API endpoint from this. So let's say there's somebody in marketing who wants to build a specific chatbot for specific conversations. They take this base URL from this system here with this token, and then they can go ahead and use a sample a statement here to actually plug into the applications and they can use that application or that chatbot to interact with the language model with all of the guard drills as well as knowledge base as part of that system. However, if this um, team in marketing doesn't have uh, someone who can perform this type of task of actually uh, coding, they can start to use the assistant immediately. And now I'm going to switch from this dashboard, which is a dashboard of the, of the administrator, uh, which can be, again, administrator can be in the business function or they can be in the central IT teams. I'm going to switch to what the marketing team is going to see. So if I switch, to a different screen here. Uh, I see the assistant UI that I have just created for the marketing marketing team. Um, so I see a bunch of assistants here that I've been creating over, the, over time. Uh, these are all based on different use cases. So again, if I go back to the original conversation around variety of teams in the company want a variety of connections for different use cases, each team of the company can have its own assistant for its own use case and its own knowledge base. So we are not all stuck with the same assistant UI. We're not all stuck with the same set of knowledge bases. Uh, we have flexibility across the system uh, from a model perspective, knowledge rate perspective, as well as assistant UI perspective. So for this particular assistant UI, this is what we get. And now we can start to have conversations with this assistant, um, using this assistant to talk to the language model in the back end. So for example, if I ask it a question, uh, what is Motific? It's going to go and go through that flow i showed at the beginning in the slide where you go through the knowledge base you talk to the you, you check uh take, take the right context you go into the guide rails with the system prompt and then you feed that into the llm so i'm going to do that and then i'm going to quickly switch back to the model to show us what's going on behind the scenes uh, so we have a monitoring tab here uh, this monitoring tab does have um, a couple of functionality uh, one of them is Shadow AI. So Shadow AI is where we're able to tell who are the folks who are using unauthorized LLMs in the company. Uh, so let's say, for example, um, you're in a company where um, the company has said, we only allow us to use Mistral models in this company. Anyone using Google Gemini, OpenAI, ChatGPT, uh, we need to be able to detect them and warn them about this. Now, this system is connected to a third party CASB API. In this case, it's a Cisco umbrella uh, CASB API where we're able to do a get call to that API. And then for every endpoint that is, defi that is defined in the system uh, that is talking to any one of these models, we're able to populate that information on this page so that the remediation can be done either on this side of the, of the administrator's uh, view or on the CASB side of the administrator's view. And so this is a tool that um, we, we, we see that is valuable for customers who are trying to, again, 
uh, ensure that they're using a system that is trustworthy. Uh, so we're not using systems that uh, has no guardrails around them and uh, has no way to control the data that is going into the system. Now, uh, another, another useful tool here is prompt history. This is where you see all of the information or the prompts that have been sent uh, across the system. So if you recall, I asked a question, I said, what is Motific on the marketing assistant? It has responded to me and gave me a set of sources for that response. Now, if I go back to the administrator's view, I can see the details of that conversation. I can see the, um, the, the, the question, I can see the context that was sent over uh, as part of that query to the LLM, and I can see the LLM response over here. And I, I can also see how many tokens were consumed. I can see the policies that were triggered as part of that conversation because I set some policies in that, in that conversation. And so this is an example of another set of information we can see in the, in the monitoring tab. And we can also see a variety of information around who is flagging the most policies, which applications, which end users, um, how many tokens are being consumed across the system by specific individuals, uh, specific specific uh, applications, and so on. Uh, and so again, a variety of information available for us here on the monitoring tab. Uh, I'm going to pause for a minute and just um, see if there's any specific questions around what I've shown so far. Um, yeah. You mentioned about uh, retail augmented generation, and uh, am I understanding right that um, Matific um, has a connector to SharePoint in this case, and then can, uh, they can, then can chunk all this information and store it in vector database, Correct. Uh, and then um, make search using using this database based on on user uh, prompt. Correct. Yes. Uh, yes. When so, you use when you use uh, prompt, what is Matific? Uh, uh, you mentioned that um, users can identify whether a rack was used in the answer or not. Yeah. Yes. So that is the hallucination um, um, uh, guardrail. So if we if a user has a query, and that query, uh, let me go back here. Uh, so if a user has a query, do you still see my screen? I, I move to the to the yeah, slide yeah. again. Yeah, I see. The query comes here and it fetches the context for the query um, that is relevant to the question. And it goes through the system prompts and then goes through guard rails and then goes over here to the model. And then the model, maybe if, for example, it's a summarization task, it summarizes information. And then the, the model actually used the data that was it was used to train, uh, the data that was used to train the model as a way to uh, respond to the question. Uh, let's, say it's a, let's just say it's a, it's a question and answer query. like. And the answer was coming from the data that was used to train the model. When this is coming back, the hallucination plugin or the hallucination uh, uh, guardrail checks for the faithfulness of the response to the knowledge base that was, or the context that was given to the query on its way out. If the response and the data in the, in the response doesn't match the context that was given to the query on its way out, then we flag it and warn the end user and say, hey, your response might have deviated from the original context that was given to it. And so depending on the choice of the user, they can decide to go ahead and use that data or that response uh, for their business task, or they can decide that, oh, I'm, I, I want to stick with context that is coming from my knowledge base. And so there's this um, ability to, for you to, to have the flexibility to say, I only need my response to come from my knowledge base or it's okay if my responses come from a mix of my third party model data as well as my knowledge base. And so that, I think that's, that, I, I believe that's the question we're asking, right? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, in case if our community want to start uh, to work with Matific, um, where they can try it? Do you have some trial version or sandbox? Yeah, sure. Uh, we do have, uh, so I'm going to, I was about to open our website. So this is motific.ai website. So uh, this is open to everybody. Um, it's a public website. You can go and start trying this for free. Uh, we have a 30 day free trial. Um, you can either log into the free trial environment where you actually have to do some connections to your own model, like I shared, uh, ingest your own data, uh, like I shared, or you can just go straight to the sandbox. The sandbox is pre-configured with everything. Uh, it has a model attached to it. It has a knowledge base attached to it. Uh, you can play around with the with the policy guardrails and, and configure them as you wish, um, but that is more uh, is an easier step for you to take uh, if you if you don't have the readiness to do 
connection to models and to knowledge bases. But again, it's free, uh, it's accessible to everybody. Uh, you can give it a try and then let us know, um, keep provide us with some feedback because we're interested in your feedback as you use this tool or use this system. Yeah, sure. I, I will share uh, both links on Sandbox and on free trial in, in the description of this video. Uh, we have two minutes left. Uh, my last questions. Um, can you highlight a few upcoming features from your roadmap? Yeah. So one, one thing that we, we, we know that is uh, very important for our customers is to um, make this not just a simple assistant-based system, but an, uh, an autonomous agent-based system. Uh, agents are going to be uh, a big uh, thing on our roadmap. Uh, we're actively working on this. Uh, and the goal is to ensure that uh, when you start to interact with the models and a variety of uh, systems in the back end, uh, these agents can automate the, the process of calling the right systems to ensure that your tasks are uh, performed in the, in the order uh, that makes it more uh, autonomous in nature. So you don't have to go individually call different systems by yourself as a user. Uh, but these agents will do the job for you. Uh, so that's something that is coming on, on our roadmap. And uh, but for for the for the existing systems or existing um, uh, features we have, we are con con continually going to make sure that they perform at, at the highest level of accuracy, uh, so that our customers get the best out of what we already have on the on the truck. Uh, but on the roadmap, we are looking at um, uh, agent agent based systems to enable customers to have this type of experience, not just from an assistant perspective. Uh, but also from a, an agentic perspective. Uh, that's that's one of the key items on our roadmap. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, thanks a lot for your demo and for um, content that you're sharing. Thanks again. You're, you're very much welcome. And thank you for having me today. Um, I'm glad to uh, share some of the exciting things we're doing here uh, in our chips uh, by Cisco. And Motific is one of those. Uh, we're happy to engage with our customers, uh, people who are trying the free trial uh, for, for the foreseeable future.